Almighty Father in heaven, in the name of your Son, our glorious and victorious Savior, Jesus Christ, we humbly ask your blessing upon our worship of you as we gather together today to observe the Christian Day of Atonement, so that we may grow more in our knowledge of you, our love for you, and our obedience to you. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Amen. Imagine someone who has a number of friends, a lot of friends, who got themselves into a financial mess. They're deeply in debt. They can't possibly ever pay the money back themselves. They can literally live to be 100 years old and give every penny they earned uh, to their debtors, their creditors, and they would still never pay it off. It's impossible for them. It's too much. So here's this individual who doesn't have to do it, but who chooses to pay their debt for them. Free and clear, everything, to completely wipe away the debt for all of those people. Now, wouldn't that be nice? There was someone who did that. There might be someone who does things like that, but they're very rare, wouldn't they be? So this individual, he goes and he gets the money from his account, takes it out of his account, and well, whether the olden days where they would send a paper check, people still use it, shouldn't say olden days, people still use it, or do it electronically, whichever way uh, they want to do it, but the money's out of their account. The person who's paying the debt for those other people the money is out of his account. He doesn't have it in him because he has paid their debt. Or has he? Well, no, because he, the money may be unavailable to him. It may be as good as gone to him. It may be as good as having been paid to him. But until the one to whom the debt is owed receives it, it's not paid. The person paying the debt, the money could be gone from them, and yet the person who the money is owed could still go after them, sue them for the money, for the payment. Even though they don't have it anymore, they could say, well, look, I don't have the money. But the person would say, well, whether you have it or not, I haven't received it, so it hasn't been paid. Well, that's that's reasonable, isn't it? The old saying, the check is in the mail, or whatever. Nowadays, even with electronic uh, banking, there's still a, typically, sometimes, uh, a time lapse for it to be processed, or whether it to be posted, whatever. So it can still happen electronically. So, what does that mean then? Can someone have gone through all the effort to pay something and no longer have the money and yet still have not have paid it? Yeah. So, what does that mean? Well, it means there are two parts in making the payment. You take the money out of your account, part A, and part B, you deliver it to the one to whom it is owed. Because if it's not delivered, even though it's gone from you, that means you're both out of it. It's out there somewhere, but it's of no use to anybody. So, what is the biblical 
point of that. You know what I'm getting you, don't you? Or do you? Because many people don't realize the purpose, the need of the Day of Atonement. Because it is the deliverance of the Passover blood. Christ made the sacrifice. He was taken. That life was taken from him. Out of his account, if you will. But if it wasn't delivered to the Father, it wasn't done. There had to be the deliverance. And it's the reason that the Messiah is called, among other things, our deliverer. Because primarily it means the deliverance to God of his blood sacrifice. Many people don't make the connection between Passover and the Day of Atonement. And it's understandable, sort of, because most people think of them as merely being Jewish or Judaism-ish rites, which they're correct in saying that, ironically, because for the people of Judaism, they don't recognize the Messiah. They don't recognize the Passover lamb as being an individual who died, gave himself of them, and of them, ironically, he was taken from his own people, so of them. But consider the difference between if it had stopped there. And even I'm, I'm quite surprised as well how many in the Church of God really don't make that connection fully. We suffer through the fast on the Day of Atonement. But do we really realize that we are also observing the fulfillment, the deliverance of passing. Because that's what's happening. And if we heard a little bit from the fast, maybe it's as well. Many people have explained it in various ways. But maybe, maybe the pain that we feel, a little bit of the pain of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Have you ever thought about that? The head-splitting headaches from... Uh, if you're a coffee drinker, well, maybe that has something to do to be compared to the, the thorns or the beatings that he took. That may be, perhaps, looking at it at a longer view, but it's correct. We know his pain. A little bit, anyway. Even to realize it is painful considering the, what he went through for us, the ones who could never pay that debt of ourselves. The Day of Atonement, many people, again, the reason, as a matter of the true prophecies of true holy days, which are prophecies of Christianity, because they are Observe once a year that many people will think, well, that's, they're an end in themselves. Oh, it's the time of year for the feast. It's the time of year for Passover. Or it's the time of year for the Day of Atonement. And it is, because it goes around and around. But I think that's moreover a matter of accommodating the generations that come one after another. Because Christ only died on the cross once. That's all he had to do. He only had to deliver the blood once. That's all he had to do. They are an annual observance of something that Christ did. Accomplished. Finished. And won't have to do again. For those who are willing to accept the sacrifice. Those who won't, well, 
was a matter of the other goat, the scapegoat. A lot of people look at the that observance there is the the goat who was killed, and there was the other goat that was taken and had all the sins put onto him. He was taken out into the wilderness, and because of the all the sins put on him, people will sort of jump to the conclusion that that meant the Messiah. And although, yes, it's true, all the sins were put on him, he was not sent out into the wilderness. He was sacrificed, as the one was, and the blood was taken in. Actually, the, the sacrifice of the Day of Atonement is actually a reiteration, a practical matter perhaps, because the Passover blood could not have been kept from spring to fall. So we had to have fresh Passover blood. But the high priest went in once a year, just as Christ went in once, period, to do that deliverance. And again, it was an annual matter. All the other sacrifices, the bulls and goats and all the rest of it, were specific to the Levites who were serving and moreover, specific sacrifices that were made for and by the high priest in order for him to be symbolically pure, symbolically sinless. Christ didn't have to do that. There is no Christian directly, such as there is with the Passover lamb, there is no direct connection to Christ because he was already sinless. Whereas Aaron and the successive high priest after him had to make that symbolic sacrifice in order to be sinless. It was sort of like a Passover, further Passover, in order for them to deliver the Day of Atonement. Successiveness. The logic, though, is an amazing thing because a lot of people don't really see the, the logic of the Holy Day, why they are, and what they are, and the necessary part of them. And again, the once, only once, why there is a separation between the holy place, the beginning, the, the entry part of the tabernacle or the temple later on, and the most holy place in which only the high priest went in once a year, which represents the throne of God and the law that was there. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. Still is. So we're looking at something that is not of itself specifically a separate holy day. It is simply a fruition, a completion of Passover. And again, reason number million and ninety nine why Christians should observe it, they don't have as much problem observing Passover, even though know, many call it Easter now. But they recognize it or at least respect it because they respect and realize that it's about Christ. But they might sneer at the Day of Atonement. Oh, those Jews, but they're fasting. I'll put the link on for the study about the origin of fasting and how, like the origin of baptism, they began in the Old Testament as given by Christ. The Lord God was born as Christ later on, as the Bible says. And how everything that was done in those symbolic rites, observances, were about Christ. Everything. The whole thing. And that applies to every one of the holy days. I'll put the links on for those studies. It's something that, if you can understand, first of all, first of all, because it's the basis of the next part of it, if you can understand that the Lord God was the one who was born as Jesus Christ, you can understand really where the Bible, the Christian Bible, which to a lot of people means Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where it really begins. And that is Genesis 1. Or the beginning of the book of John, which is actually before that. In the beginning is the Word. And the Word was with God. So it's something we can look at and see in its Christian application. And here we are as the biblical church of God. I know people use that term. 
in a corporate sense, the, the name of the corporation or the group, uh, the Church of God, this Church of God, that. And many people think that it applies to some man-made church. Many people think that the Armstrong tradition of churches, people actually use the term Church of God for that, even though in fact it was that term was used before them. But it's biblical. It's, it's recorded in the Bible. It means the people of God. That's all it means. So it doesn't mean a building. It doesn't mean a place. Ironically, when they were first began observing it, they didn't have a building. They were kicked out of their building. They were kicked out of the, the synagogues or the gathering places, wherever that was. That's the reason they met in people's homes or down by the river someplace or wherever they could. They were kicked out of all the official government-sponsored, government-sanctioned, here's your corporate papers kind of buildings and churches. Which, by the way, in the Roman time, they probably had. Very likely. But Christ's deliverance of his blood for us to the Father is a simple matter. It's not two holy days. It is a continuation of Passover. And as such, it is Christian. It can be no less Christian. It can't be anything but Christian. And again, even the pain of the, the fast. I think, moreover, has more to do with a little feeling of his sacrifice than merely the other explanations that I've heard about. It makes us uh, realize how connected we are to the earth is one common one. And that's true. It is true. We do depend upon it. Water and food. Or we get uncomfortable when we lose our connection to that. That makes sense. But I think moral what's about his pain. His deliverance. Once the deliverance is made, when the sun goes down at the end of the day, the pain stops. Because it isn't about pain, it's about deliverance. And the beauty of that. And how, as we go along, we can look at things in a way that we could never see them before. And sometimes, pain is a great healer. That seems like a paradox. The Bible's full of them. So full of them. Pain is a healer. Because look at what Christ went through. The pain that he went through. So that humanity could be healed. And even the people who are dying of natural causes. Or in a car accident. Or in a war. A victim of crime. The pain from that. Is also a part of the healing. Because the pain of death brings about the time of resurrection. It doesn't happen yet, but it will in due time. But from a dead person's conscious perspective, it's there. Perfectly healed again. Imagine going from being in terrible pain. And you know, we in the modern world have it easy in the sense that we have available to us uh, medical technology and drugs and things that that enable people to not suffer just as much. Whereas not so long ago, uh, it was a very different matter. You know, people were had to really go through a lot of pain, trip to the dentist. Or some of the things during war time, amputations that were done with, with nothing. Nothing. Other than three or four people holding down the person who was injured. If he was lucky, sometimes alcohol was used, but nevertheless, we have it much easier now. But nevertheless, there's still the matter of knowing and the psychological pain is not here for that. But again, I think it's a great healer. 
Imagine what Christ went through, even on the night before his sacrifice. How he prayed so mightily, such fervent emotion. His drops of sweat were like blood. And there apparently, I read, there was actually a medical condition in which people can sweat blood. It can happen. So it may have been literal in that description. When someone is that emotional, they can literally sweat blood. I mean, it's physically it doesn't seem that out, outlandish in that the blood is right there under the skin. That people can blush. So on. I'm not a doctor or anything like that, medical doctor, but it's it's something that. He may well have literally sweat blood, drops of blood. Thing. It's very rare, but Christ was very rare too. And the things that he went to, how he died, all of that, no broken bones, no strangulation. And again, now, the reason the legs were broken, typically, is that when the time was enough when they let them suffer enough they would break the legs so that they would hang down the person would hang down the condemned person and they could no longer breathe it became it was gorily gruesomely uh, an act of mercy because they could then uh, be strangled become golden from at least uh, horrendous pain from the crucifixion but Christ didn't he was already dead and I think from just from the beating the beating that he endured was far worse even though he had no broken bones but it was far worse than the other ones the other men there blood loss was likely what killed him and again you know, how appropriate that is by his shed blood, and he died on the cross from blood loss, rather than broken legs and strangulation. And you know, that again, something that fits. How many people realize that? And the severe beating that he took, by his stripes were healed, uh, but by his blood from those stripes were healed. By the time everything else had been done, uh, he likely just died of blood loss. Again, because that was the whole point of it all. The Passover lamb and the deliverance as we're covering today later of that blood on the day of atonement to the throne of God. But we can look at something like this, the detail that is available to us. And it isn't a matter of not of saying, well, why observe the holy days? It becomes a matter of if we're going to observe as a matter of prophecy, we have to. People would probably observe them if you understood and understand what was really going on in the necessary part of that deliverance. You probably, people would probably be observing it in some way anyway. Because they would know the sacrifice alone wasn't enough. It was not the deliverance. It was not the delivery of the sacrifice. Someone can sacrifice, again to use the, the worldly example, they can sacrifice money out of their account. But if it's not delivered, it's just a waste. The person took it out, who took it out of the account, they don't have it. But the person to whom it's owed doesn't have it either. Maybe out there somewhere. It may be lost. But that's a waste. It has to be taken from the one paying it, and it has to be delivered to the one to whom it is owed. That is Passover, the Day of Atonement. Together. Year one. Let's have a look more closely at some scriptures.
I referred to this earlier, but it's important. It's an important understanding. John 1, 1 to 3 and 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. How many people accept that for what it really says, for what it actually says? And that's from the New Testament. You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. For many people, that's their Bible. Well, there's the Bible, and it makes it very startling to them, to some people, to all of us in the beginning, a statement of reality. Because if you do accept that, if you become aware of it and accept it, because you have to do both, then all of a sudden the Sabbath becomes the Christian Sabbath, because Christ made it. And the Ten Commandments, the Lord God, as we'll get to also, as Paul stated, you know, it was Christ, that rock was Christ. And then the Ten Commandments, it's Christ that's identified. I am the Lord God who brought you out of Egypt. And his Sabbath, his holy days. And then he went on to his annual holy days, which are about Christ. It's all Christian. Everything. Never mind that some people have made it into a religion for themselves. The people of Judaism did it. They made it into a state religion. And I'm not criticizing them because the Christian professing world did it even more by sheer numbers. The Church of Rome is exactly that. Doctrinally, there is no difference between the Church of Rome's core doctrines and those of the Protestant claiming church. I say claiming because really, doctrinally, as far as biblical truth concern, is concerned, the Protestant Reformation never happened. They just carried it on. They rejected their leadership, chose their own leaders, but they kept the script, their own little script. Nothing changed. They believed the same thing. It's the reason in the end time, when the Pope's false miracles begin, the Protestants are going to run home to Rome, figuratively speaking, very, very easily, very, very quickly. They won't have a problem doctrinally doing it at all. And as we can see in the world today, sometimes the most unlikely leaders become leaders, misleaders of vast numbers of people. And they think they like it. And so they do. But continue. As we said, or as Paul said, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. And the word ignorant there does not mean not knowing. It means to know something and choose to ignore it. To ignore it means to be ignorant. It means ignoring something you know. So these people knew. He was saying, I would not that you should ignore it. They knew it. And that's how it worked on. Throughout all the things that happened. But consider the holy days. Leviticus 23, 26 to 32. I'm trying to keep these together because they are. How's that for a simple reason? And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of this seventh month there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be in holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls, and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And ye shall do no work on that same day, for it is a day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted, in that same day he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, that same soul, the same soul, I will, will I destroy from among his people. 
You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest. And ye shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month of even. From even unto even ye shall celebrate your Sabbath. And again, you notice, keeping in mind that soul means body. It's not a spiritual matter. I'll put the link on for what and where is your soul. It's your body. A soul is a living, breathing creature. And when it says to afflict, you know, if someone is afflicted with something, that means pain or injury. And again, as we said earlier, the Day of Atonement, I believe that pain that one experiences has to do directly with the fact that the Day of Atonement is a fulfillment of Passover in which Christ was afflicted with pain that we can experience as well from the discomfort of the Day of Atonement. The connection is, is so obvious, I think, and yet for many years we may have just not accepted it or realized it. Accept may be not a good word because that would be ignorant because we, we weren't ignorant if we didn't know. We would be now because we do know now. But the affliction there, you know, I think is directly related to Passover. What else can it be? Considering it's the blood, the Passover blood that is being delivered, the putting away of Satan, it's also prophetic because because he did what he did, that made him, that gave him the mandate to return and put away Satan. Because until he did that, he didn't do that. You know, the, the so-called temptation of Christ was real. It wasn't a farce. It wasn't just sort of a play, some little play game. It was for real. And it could have happened. It really could have happened. And you know, so much of what Satan does is about bait. How he baits people. How he does things. There is a cynical belief, actually, that things like easy debt is really a matter, not only of the interest that they make if you don't pay it, but many people think that there is a cynicism under there in which people will do that credit card companies or whatever, will do that in the hope that somehow something will happen, you'll fall behind, and they can really get you. I don't think that's true, but I think in some cases the spirit of that sort of a thing is there. And it's something, you know, if you can look at how Satan operates, the bait that he makes, the easy thing. Here's a free sample. And then, there you go. From that. You know, Eve took a free sample of the fruit. The woman did. She wasn't named Eve yet. The man standing right there, it was to both of them. As it happens, Eve was the one doing the talking, but the male was right there. She took of the fruit and gave some to her husband who was there. And they were put out. There it went. Fig leaves, I think, are, it was, I believe it was fig fruit. I mean, we know there were figs there because immediately when their eyes were opened, figuratively speaking, they took fig leaves. So they must have been right handy. And the irony of that, just consider the irony of that. After taking of the fruit of that one tree that made them sinners, I wonder if they made clothes of themselves from that same tree. How the cover-up, the means of the cover-up, came from the very reason that the cover-up was made. And again, you know, the, the ironies of things, I, in the Bible I don't think there is much ironies as they are profound truths, the depth of something, the reason for something. And keeping in mind that Satan, although profoundly evil, He's profoundly intelligent. He's not wise anymore. He's thrown that away. It was his wisdom, the misuse, the perversion of his wisdom that made him into the devil, as we read. He thought it was all about him. He thought his greatness was somehow his own creation. My, aren't I wonderful? Aren't I so much better? And whether he's the the leader 
of the demons and everything. There's nothing that ever in the Bible whatsoever that says he's a leader of anybody. I think when you're that messed up, you can't be a follower. You know, independence can be taken to psychotic extremes. And I think Satan is there. But they always had the freedom to choose, obviously, just as the humans did, just as we do. We can choose to ignore or be ignorant of the truth that we come to know, free to do that. But we're not free to carry it on into salvation, to demand of Christ, to demand of his sacrifice, his blood, to just claim his name and do as we please and demand that he in effect bow before our choices, what we want, our religions, our churches, down at my church or my Bible or my Jesus. Those terms mean far more perhaps than any people realize, although in some cases I think they do. Because it is their Jesus and their church and their Bible. If they don't really do what's really there, then it's somebody else. But the choices that are there for us to realize, it's just an amazing thing. But consider what the purpose of that high priest. He was chosen as a prophetic figure of Christ himself. Aaron, that Levite. Consider Leviticus 16.20. 22, and when he has made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat, and Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities into a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. Some people mis misbelieve that to be the, the Christ, but it's, it's the sin has been will be put on the head of Satan, the Messiah that was sacrificed. I'll put the links on for those studies. Satan is going to be put away, apparently, into a place, a pit, spiritual pit. It won't be a dark place, I don't think, because Satan is bright. He'll bring his own light. He's still light, according to the Word of God. He's evil, but he's still bright and beautiful. So it'll be a well-lit place. But he will be put away so that he can't deceive anymore. He'll be put away forever. And even the release after the, the thousand years, you know, it, it's a chance for him to repent. Time is meaningless to him. That's true physical time. It may seem like a blink. Just as to the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day. So as far as sitting in prison for a thousand years, for Satan would be a whole lot different than would be for a human. But humans aren't going to either. Because the lake of fire is an incineration of the physical body. It will be obliteration totally. Be as though they never existed. But Satan is going to get what he deserves. All the sins of humanity. The blame will be put on him. But the payment for those who are repentant will be put on Christ. That's the reason for the sacrifice. The reason for the blood. And again, the blood of the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement, I think, is a continuation of Passover, simply because for the practical matter, they couldn't have kept the blood for those five or six months from the time of Passover. They couldn't have done it. And again, the reasoning, the continuation of what is there and had been, keeping in mind we're, we're talking about physical observances, physical rites, prophetic rites that are continued year after year after year whereas Christ only did them once 
He only had to. The book of Hebrews describes that in detail. We don't have time to go through all of that, but I refer you to it. And again, the blood of bulls and goats were done specifically. There were other versions of it for the Levites in order to have them symbolically clean, ceremonially clean to serve at the tabernacle or the temple, but primarily for the high priest so that he would be symbolically clean to take that blood, the Passover atonement. I use that word hyphenated there. In. Because it was the pure, sinless Christ that took it once and for all into the throne of God. That's the reason for all those other sacrifices. And why those particular ones don't refer to Christ because Christ was out of the sins. But the Passover blood surely does. Absolutely surely does. There is no doubt about it. And are we just philosophizing all of this? Some people would say so. Well, I'll say that's just your opinion. This is what you believe, but this is we believe something else. Well, the world is full of that. But we're not just philosophizing. Consider Hebrews 3, 1 to 2. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who is faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. And I emphasize the word there, high priest, because he was the high priest, not as a matter of coming after Aaron and somehow taking his place or assuming that role, but rather that the office of high priest, the first of whom was Aaron, was created as a prophecy of Christ. By Christ, he did it himself. The purpose of it all. But again, read this carefully. And consider the connection. The at oneness of the Day of Atonement to the Day of Passover. Days of Passover. Because there's also the matter of the Days of Passover, the acceptance of the sacrifice by living a repentant life. But consider, so plain. Hebrews 9, 11 to 12. But Christ, being come an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither of the blood of goats and cows, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Number points there. The cycle, as we said, was annual, as an annual reminder of something that Christ will do once as it was really given to be a prophecy. And over time, that cycle was like a wheel going around on a journey. You can think of it that way through time. Like a wheel on an automobile keeps turning. Each time around is a year. And a little farther down, there's more people getting on and off into the vehicle. Maybe call it a bus or a train, whatever you want. Coming in their lives and getting off when it's done. And the point is we express, explained, neither by the blood of goats and cows. Now that was something specific to Aaron. Aaron wasn't sinless. He was symbolizing someone who was, though. So those sacrifices were made for him. Christ didn't have to. For his own purity, so that he was worthy to enter into something that Christ never needed to do because he was already pure. But you see, it's all there. We're not teaching something off on a on a limb somewhere, or we're around a corner somewhere. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Word of God says. What can we do? There it is. We can choose to accept it, or we can choose to ignore it. And there's that word, ignorant again. But there it is. Hebrews 10, 11 to 13, And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which could never take away sins, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. 
And again, that's the second part of the Day of Atonement, the putting away of Satan and Satan's world and those who cling to Satan's ways. Because as we also read, we get to, the world is actually going to open fire on the returning Christ. After they murder the two greatest prophets that will ever live, the two witnesses at the time, and celebrate their deaths, leave their dead bodies in the streets for over three days, celebrating until they're resurrected. The Lord will resurrect them. But there it is. And again, how someone imagine if they take, as the people of Judaism have done, taken those holy days, made them into their own nationalistic observances. And then people will look at that and say, well, you're observing the Jewish uh, holy days. Well, no, we're observing the Christian holy days. What we observe is not what the people of Judaism observe. Nor would Moses have observed it in that way. Because what is known as Judaism originated largely after the return of the Babylonian, from the Babylonian, their Babylonian exile in the time of Nehemiah. Nehemiah certainly, and Ezra and Zerubbabel certainly would never have, never have accepted that. Nor would have Moses much earlier. But from that time on, it, it began, I'm sure, same as the Pharisees and Sadducees and the Essenes and all the, the different sects that developed at that time. Probably they began just as a matter of, we want to get this right. We don't want to be taken away to Babylon again. So let's get this right. And that's fine. They became the lawyers. The experts in the law. But the thing is, they started adding things to the law. Even if, in effect, codicils to the will of Christ, if you will. And they ended up with something very different. They buried it. And the Messiah, when he came, he rebuked them for it. He says how they had turned the law of God into their own traditions. And he rebuked them for it. They called him a sinner because he was observing what was originally given rather than their man-made traditions. And there's a difference. And But people seem to throw out one with the other. They say, well, he wasn't observing Judaism, so you throw away the Old Testament. But they aren't observing the Old Testament either. And even the, even the so-called lost ten tribes never observed it. They never knew Judaism. They were gone. About 300 years before the Babylonian exile happened to the southern kingdom of Judah. They never knew any of that. They had no Pharisees or Essenes or Sadducees. They had none of it. They were gone. They didn't even have Levites, faithful ones, because they all went south. After Jeroboam created his own state religion. They left. They left behind their lands, by the way, as well. It was a costly move for them. But it showed where their hearts were. They gave up literally everything they owned to hold to the truth. But eventually, the younger generations later on lost it. They lost it. And so they were taken away. But when they returned, well, we're never going to have that again. And of course, the times of the, the Greeks, the abomination of desolation, the, the defilement of the temple. Some, some people think that Antiochus Epiphanes sacrificed a, a pig as a direct insult to the people of Judah. But the fact is, that was part of his religion. Pigs were a part of his religion when he sacrificed that pig. A pig to him, sacrificing a pig to him is like the people of Judah sacrificing a lamb. So, it, and he did what he did. And then the Maccabees, of course, they, it was an amazing victory, really, that they were able to drive them out. The Greek Empire had been broken up by that time. They were weakened, that's true. But it was still a battle, and they won it. And it continued on. And then the Romans, of course, came. The Roman power invaded everything and spread like a malignancy across southern Europe and into the Middle East, just as far as the land of Israel taking over largely what Alexander the Great did, although he didn't go much past Arabia. They didn't. And so the Messiah was born as a Roman citizen. He would have had a birth certificate, and I think he, there is a record. We know there's a record, that census. Imagine if they found that, that Bethlehem census. And there are old documents, things much older than that, that have been found in, our, in existence. Imagine if they found 
that Bethlehem senses from the time of the Romans. Imagine that. It wouldn't record Christ probably, but probably would have recorded Mary as about to have a child. And even the recording of, of Joseph and Mary, or Yusuf and Miriam in Hebrew, would itself be in the greatest archaeological discovery ever. And there are people who think the Vatican had it. Well, they can. It's in Rome somewhere, probably. That's where those records would have been kept. And why would they hide it? Well, time of year for one thing. Early autumn really cuts into the, the Christmas idea. Sol Invictus and the rising sun. All the things that they have foisted upon the Christian professing world. So there's reasons for things. Same as the discovery of America. Columbus got the credit for that, even though he was 500 years after the Vikings. But don't forget Columbus, he was working for Ferdinand and Isabella, the enforcers of Roman Catholicism in, in Europe at that time. The Spanish Inquisition was there, was there doing waterboarding, was their invention as a mockery, intended as it was created as a mockery of true baptism. So they were given, he was given the credit for that, even though he, was, he never went past the, Med, the, the Caribbean Sea. The Vikings were there 500 years before that, but they were regarded as heathens, a little too independent, too Rome rejecting. So history was simply manipulated, diverted. But it's not a secret. Everybody knows it. It's just that very few accept it, the reality of what they did. And it wasn't just a matter of them being blown off course. There were settlements. Still remnants, things found on the east coast of North America. In Greenland, they made it. Circular route. It looks circular on a, on a flat map, but it was actually more direct than it is. But that's what happened. And how history can be, in plain sight, be perverted like that. I mean, there's all sorts of those. All sorts of them. But it happened. And, you know, the things that I think when all things, when Christ returns and all things are made known, imagine that. We're going to know history. There are really things that really happen. Really happen. All the politics and all the manipulation of records. All going to be gone. The truth is going to be there. Imagine that. What history, real history will be. It probably won't be pretty. Probably nowhere near as pretty as the the sugar-coated stuff that people have created for themselves. But nevertheless, it will be true. And the truth is always beautiful. No matter how ugly the reality is that it's revealed by it. Now, many people are familiar with these verses that we're about to read. Probably each of us read them many times. But did we really realize that we were reading about the Day of Atonement, the fulfillment of it? Both parts we'll get to here briefly. We'll put on the links for those other studies. But that's what's describing the prophet. Daniel saw it, the prophet John. I call him the prophet John because the book of Revelation is certainly a great prophecy. He's more commonly known as the Apostle John. He's a prophet as well. And in looking at what we see based on what they saw, from their time perspective, it's describing the Day of Atonement. Consider Daniel 7, 13 to 14, And in night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him, his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. Now, the reason he was given that mandate is because he was successful in living out his life, making the sacrifice, and then here delivering, as we read here. Because, Revelation 5, 9-10, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy 
to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto God, unto our God, kings and priests and shall reign on the earth. The deliverance. That wasn't spoken on earth when he came out of the tomb. Because he did his part. That's true. When he died on the cross, it wasn't said. He did his part, but the deliverance was not yet made. That was only completed. When he entered the most holy place, as symbolized by the high priest, once a year. In that annual cycle, the wheel going around. The vehicle of time. It's wheels going around. But now consider the other part, that scapegoat. And this, that the word is actually a scapegoat. Escape goat. Two words. It's not just scapegoat. And it's taken on a whole different meaning as though someone is innocent. Or well, they, he's the scapegoat for what somebody else did. No. The scapegoat is someone who has given, been given the responsibility for what they've done. As we read, all the sins of humanity that he incited. But consider the second part. Revelation 20, 1-3 And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand, and they laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, who bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should not deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. That, that is at the end. It is as much a test of humanity who will by that time never have been tested, because Satan will have been put away at the time of the return of Jesus Christ. But I think it's also, this is sort of a side issue, Satan's final possibility, final offer to repent. And he won't. And the thousand years, again, means nothing to him. The time part of it uh, will, will mean nothing to him. But eternity is something I think he can understand and appreciate. And so he will have made his choice. He chose, ultimately, the most ignorant of all, the Satan, because he knew the law of God and chose to ignore it and to rebel against it. Both. He did both. But as we see in what is done there, the simplicity, some of the things we read about, we focus very much on the sacrifice, and that's that's true, that's true. But you know, the, the check is in the mail, as far as that is concerned, the deliverance also has to be made. Christ did his part, but until the payment was made, it wasn't made. The payment was not made until it was delivered. And again, as we read, as he stood before the throne of God, then he was given that scroll. The King James renders it as a book. It's actually a scroll. shed the seals, sections, chapters, if you will, uh, sealed one to another, one section to another. In order to open one, you have to work your way through those before it. But it was something that I think, moreover, throughout the whole entire Bible, as I started to say, it's more about the Day of Atonement, the deliverance of that blood, than it is actually about Passover. As much about Passover, it, is, it, is, it of course is, but it's without the deliverance. It's the very important thing, and the tragedy of it, that so many Christians ignore that day. But in fact, it's about Christianity. It's the ultimate purpose of being called out. Because if there were no deliverance, if there were no payment made for sin, the calling out would be pointless. Just as Christ's sacrifice would have been if it wasn't delivered. And again, you can see how the com complete completeness of all that was done and planned and read. And how, again, so tragically people will look at the prophecies of those so-called Old Testament holy days and ignore them or mock them when in fact they are prophecies of Christ. And very much more, more so, the Day of Atonement. I've really come to appreciate more 
over the time that I've been teaching what's here because we learn. It's like that wheel, the wheel of learning. It's a wheel of learning as well. And how the pain of the Day of Atonement, as I said, I think is just a little reminder of the pain that he had for his getting of that blood, that atonement. In the English, the, the, the at one meant with God, and that's true, but some people have drawn almost an end in itself of that, and it's, it's more. It's much more. But again, the beauty of it. But again, the freedom. You know, we don't have to accept it all. All that has been done, everything that has been accomplished, can be ignored, because we have to deliver ourselves as well, by means of repentance. You can't just go off in a corner and demand salvation under our own terms, because that just isn't it. One can claim to be a Christian, in effect, make the payment out of their account, and live a supposedly Christian life, but until they really do it, the deliverance doesn't apply to them, because they've chosen not to go where they had to go, and that is out of this world, out of this world's attitudes. Because if we don't do it, we're not there. Just as if Christ had not delivered that blood, he wouldn't have been there either. The Day of Atonement is Christian. More Christian than a lot of people realize, and far more Christian as we read through the Bible, so many of the things that apply actually to the Day of Atonement more than they do to Passover, even though they are one. 